we as a church, kind of what we do here, and it's kind of even weird to say that because we're only a month in, but what we do here as a church is we take books of the Bible and we just journey and walk through verse by verse through that book of the Bible. And so for the, the next while as a church, at least for the, probably the rest of the year at this rate, let's face it, uh, we are studying and going through the book of 2 Timothy. And, and you may think, well, why start with 2 Timothy? Why, why would you not start with some like Romans or, or, or something, Genesis? Wouldn't that make more sense? Probably, but anyway, this is, I don't know why they put me in charge of this thing, but I really felt led that 2 Timothy, if you look at it and if you just study it, even just at surface level, it is a book that's all about discipleship. It's a book about investing in other people. Because Paul, he is right, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to this young pastor named Timothy. And Timothy is the pastor of this church in Ephesus where we get the book of Ephesians. He's the pastor of that church. And that church has just kind of gone haywire. It's not going very well. And there's kind of false doctrine and false teachings. And, and Jesus is kind of putting on this low pedestal. And Jesus isn't the God of the universe anymore. And so this, it's kind of a messed up kind of church. And Paul is encouraging Timothy to keep going. To keep going. And one of the things that we talked about last week is that Paul mentions to Timothy that, that the spirit of, of this holy and righteous God, the spirit did not give you the ability to fear. For God did not give you the spirit of fear. But he gives us, he gave Timothy, th this fearful, timid, young pastor who's shaken in his boots. Paul, from prison, He's writing from prison towards the end of his life. He says, Timothy, don't fear. Do not be afraid. Keep going, bro. You got this because here's the reality. Here's the truth. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He dwells in you. And it's impossible for the Holy Spirit to fear. So that Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, fear should not be present whatsoever. But instead, there should be power, there should be love, and there should be self-control. So go lead. Go pastor. And so for us, that fear is one of those things that will cripple your dream, cripple any pursuit that you have of Jesus. And we talked about how if the gospel is what it is, and if Jesus is who he says he is, then fear can't dictate your life. Fear can't tell you what to do because fear is not in charge. Because the spirit that dwells inside of you, like I said, it can't fear. It never has. It never will. And that's what's fighting for you. That's what lives inside of you. Yes, we have moments where it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But the only time that we fear is the moment that we take our eyes off of him. That's the only time that we fear. At least for me, and I can assume that's probably you as well. And so as a church, we're, I, I'm encouraging this, you the same way Paul was encouraging Timothy. This profound truth that God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. And we're not going to allow the fear to cripple the dream. We're not going to allow fear to tell you that you're not good enough, that you don't know enough. Oh, you didn't, you, you got a messed up past. Oh, you got this, you got that, you've done this, you've done that. You didn't go to seminary, you can't do this. That's what fear will tell you. But Jesus has other words. And I, and I love how, how Paul, he kind of takes a shift after that passage. And, and we're moving right along, so let's kind of keep going. So Paul is making this shift to, again, communicate to, to Timothy to not fear, and now he wants to remind him to be loyal to the truth and the promises of God. And, and do you ever find, I know for me sometimes, you, you find it hard to be loyal. You find it hard to be loyal. Because we're, there's so many things in this world that lets us down. There's friends that let us down. There's even family that let us down. There's coworkers. They're, they're whatever. Churches, pastors, they will all let us down. So it, it makes it difficult for us to become loyal to things. And I, and I look at you Tennessee fans, like you're, you're you don't know what to do. Like, do I be loyal? What do I do here? <laughs> Honey, get your purse. We're leaving. We don't like this place. But it makes it hard to be loyal with things. Which is, again, people will let you down. 
And, and I've said this time and time again. I'll say it time and time again. I will let you down. But I'm not asking you to be loyal to me. I'm not asking you really to be loyal to the rising. I'm simply asking you to be loyal to the gospel of Jesus because the one thing that is worth being loyal to because he will never let you down, because he is the life giver, he is the redeemer. I am not those things. You are not those things. And so that's what Paul is trying to get through Timothy as as he's moving into, hey, don't fear, but make sure that you know what you believe. Make sure that you believe and follow through with it. And my prayer for the rising is that we would never again be loyal to the rising, but you would be loyal to the gospel of Jesus. Do I want you to partner with us in ministry and to be a part of our fellowship and our family? Absolutely, of course. But if we're keeping the main thing the main thing, because what, what can happen, and it easily happens. I, I've been in church a long time. I was, I was born on Friday in church on Sunday. Like, I've been there. Like, I, I've always been there, all right? It can be easy for us to fall in love and be loyal to the way church does things. We, we fall in love with, with programs. We fall in love with, with certain systems that are in place. We, we fall in love with certain, even certain events, and here we are having our first event on Sunday. But, like, you can fall in love with that. You can fall in love with, oh, I just love the worship music. I love the kids' ministry. I, I love the free coffee. I love the granola bar, whatever that we're giving out that week. Like, I love that. And we lose sight of what we're truly supposed to be loyal to. Because the church is not made, and this may sound harsh, the church was not created so that you could be comfortable. The church was created, again, to be a launching pad, a sending platform, so that we could go and make disciples of all nations, including our nation. And so that's what Paul is saying here. We, we fall in love with the process of church instead of the promises of God. So may we be loyal to the promises of God. And I understand, like, loyalty is hard. It's, it's, it, it, you got to earn people's trust. I get that. And people find it hard to trust people. I get that. So it makes it even harder for a non-believer when somebody says, hey, you should follow Jesus. Hey, you should come to my church. Hey, do you know this? Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that there's this Holy Spirit that fear doesn't exist and he gives you the, 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 the power and love and self-control? You, you say that to a non-believer, a person that doesn't believe in Jesus, didn't grow up in church, or maybe they've been burned from the church. They, they don't want anything to do with the church. And it makes it hard for them. To, well, okay, I get that. I've, yeah, I've seen that t-shirt with that verse, got the coffee mug. I get that. But for us as believers, for us as disciples, in order to be loyal to something, you have to follow something. So yes, we can come, we can be comfortable, we can sit in our seat, we can raise our hands during worship, we can fall to our knees during prayer time, we can do this, we can fill out the connection card because the pastor told us to, we can give, we can go, we can do all those things and still never make a disciple. Because the heartbeat of who we are is to make disciples. That's why we exist, to point people to Jesus. Not to ourself, not to a fancy logo on a screen or a cool t-shirt, but to Jesus. That's why we're here. So, all that, this is why it's going to take us nine years to get through this. Let's start back through verse 11. All right, That's the, kind of the last uh, little group of scripture that we left off last week, and then we'll get into verse 13 is where we're starting this week. But 11 and 12 give you some context where we're headed. Here we go. Paul says to this, to Timothy, For this gospel I have appointed a, a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. He, he's saying these things about himself, uh, Paul. And that is why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed because I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day, the day that God has called me home. And then verse 13. Paul says, hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Let's stop right there. Now, again, if we go back to Acts chapter 16 where all of this kind of starts, where Paul and the the elders of the church in Ephesus lay hands on young Timothy, reminding him who he is in Christ and commissioning him to plant and to shepherd and to pastor this church. So what he's saying is, remind those things that I I prayed over you. You remember that? And it's going to get hard, Timothy. It's tough. 
But I promise you, if you rely and hold on to the pattern of sound teaching, sound doctrine, you will be reminded that it's worth it. And, and listen, like all of us go through moments in our life as Christ followers where we pursue Jesus, we trust Jesus, then something happens, whether it be our own fault or something else happens, and we lose sight of this kind of sound teaching, this, this doctrine that's been inside of us for years. And, and we lose sight of God's word being God's word. It, it turns into this, just this boring book. It's no longer God's word. But what Paul is saying to Timothy is, dude, hold on to it. It's going to get hard. It's going to get rough. People are going to say things about you that aren't true. People are going to do things against you to stop you from what you're doing. Hold on to it. Hold on to the truth and the promises of God. Don't let go. Don't let culture, don't let society talk you out of and say, oh, it's just, this isn't relevant. This teaching, this Jesus isn't, isn't relevant. It's not very applicable today. And you hear that even today that, you know, the Bible is just so old school. It's so ancient that we can't really apply it to it today. Things have changed. Culture's changed. People have changed. And so now the word of God is no longer the word of God. But the truth is, as I read scripture, I don't, know, I don't know if you, when this happens to you, but when I read this book, when I read the Bible, I'm reminded of how applicable it is today. Because I could go through the list and, oh, self-righteousness, yeah, we, we struggle with that. Oh, fear, yeah, we really struggle with that. And so you can't say, oh, it's this ancient book that doesn't really relate to us anymore. I think it relates to us more than maybe it did back then. Because we live in a culture, we live in the culture that it's all about us. And so we need to be reminded that it's all about Christ. So the reality is, is that sound teaching, sound doctrine leads to effective ministry. So if God calls you to do something, whatever it may be, start a ministry, pray for somebody, start a nonprofit, feed the homeless, do this, go on a mission trip, all those things. Unless you have a sound teaching, sound understanding of doctrine, basically the belief of Christianity, you'll never be effective. You'll never be effective. Because if you're relying on simply your talents, the yes that God has given you, and all they are is your talent, it will never be long-standing. It will, it will never last. Because you get tired, you'll get bored, you want to move on to the next thing. But if we are rooted in the word of God, we are rooted in what God is teaching us, and we believe in those promises and what he did for us, and that he dwells inside of us, that's what makes us effective. Not your talent. It's the Holy Spirit being effective through you. He is using you. So in, 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 in a way that we should say, thank you, Holy Spirit, like because we are nothing without you. We would never last without you. So that's what Paul is reminding him here. And, and, and I know, like, I, most of my background is in student ministry. And I can't tell you how many times that I've preached on, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. And every response, most of the time, is, I don't like to read. I just don't. And maybe you are sitting there and like, <laughs> yeah, I haven't read since high school, Okay. I read the menu at Chick-fil-A. That's about it, okay? So reading's not your thing. And I get that. I, 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 I'm, my attention is very kind of limited, and a lot of times if I read, I can't read a lot, okay? Because I, 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 I tend to focus on one chapter, if that. If, I, if I'm a quiet time, my daily devotional, whatever it may be, a lot of times I just make it through one verse, just one verse, there's, honestly, there's been moments in, in my journal and things that I've written down through the years where I focused just on one word. That was it. That's all I could get through. But here's the, the truth. Like, if we are not in the word on a daily basis, we can't expect God to use us effectively because we're not grounded in his truth. And, and I know that's like, oh, that's so Sunday school. Yeah, read your Bible, read your Bible. But seriously, like... If you're wanting to get to know somebody, you find out what their likes and their dislikes are. 
And the only way to find out what God likes and dislikes is to get to know him through his book. Like every book in here, every letter that was written, all 66 of them, is about one thing. Every, from Genesis to Revelation, from old to new, points to one thing. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Every bit of it points to Jesus. Even the weird stuff in the Old Testament. Now you're thinking, really? What's that? Every bit of it. Every bit of it. All of it. And so for us to grow in our faith, we have to get in this book. We have to. And, and I know, like, listen, I, I know you're busy. And, 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 there's, and I can be transparent and vulnerable with you here too. Like, I don't get in the Word every single day. I just don't. And, and I know that I should, and I'm pursuing that. But that doesn't make me any less of a Christ follower. But there, if there's been weeks, there's been months, you haven't read your Bible since Christmas Eve service. You haven't read it since Easter. You haven't read it. The only scripture that you read is on the coffee mug, on your uh, coffee mug at home. You know what I'm saying? Like that's all that you're getting. And we're not going to grow. So I, I, I would encourage you, just start small. There, there's apps out there that are incredible. There, there's tools and resources that you can use that will help you, that you can find something that works for you, because I know a lot of you can't just open up your big study Bible and start reading. And I get that. So I use apps, I use emails that they send me and resources and articles that I can read. Something that, that gets the word in me somehow. It, it may not be me just sitting in a quiet space or just reading my big thick family Bible. But somehow through worship songs, through just resources, through sermons that I'm listening to, whatever it may be, the word is getting in me somehow. May, may you just start right there. Just start right there. But the thing is we have to get in the word because we're never going to grow. We're never going to grow unless we learn and grow in the teaching and doctrine of Jesus. All right? Because here's the, here's the truth. Like doctrine is not just a foundation for good works. Doctrine is not just a good foundation for good works. Rather, sound doctrine causes good works. So if we know what we're studying and we believe what we're studying, and God is beginning to transform the way that we see things, and I promise you that's going to happen. He changes your perspective on people, on God, and on just your stuff and your own life. Suddenly, we can't help ourselves but want more. And it allows us to do the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say in verse 14, he says, Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Again, it was the Holy Spirit who committed the truth to Timothy. And he, the Spirit, would help him guard it. See, apart from the Holy Spirit, the Word of God will never have any weight or power. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts your heart. It is the Holy Spirit that sanctifies you. That helps you grow. He, he is defined as the helper. And it's like if you've ever read something in your quiet time. Have you seen something? It's a verse, passage, sermon. Maybe it's something that you've read and seen for years. Like you remember it back from BBS days, all right? And suddenly you read that same passage, same verse that you've read for years. And all of a sudden you stumble upon it and you read it and it profoundly wakes you up. It's the same verse, nothing's changed since you were five years old, drinking jungle juice and butter cookies. It's the same God, but yet for some reason when you read it, it wakes you up. Wonder why? That's the Holy Spirit. It's a prime example of the Holy Spirit. Something that just speaks to you. Something that you read and like, oh gosh, I needed that. The Holy Spirit, what he does through the word of God is that he, he brings you out of the pit. He brings you out of a place where you think you can do it all by yourself. And he convicts your heart so that you can turn back to the Holy One, so that you can turn back to Jesus. That's what he does. And the only way he will do that is, one way he does that, is through the word of God. And so we can't lose sight of just, yes, it's good to gather. Yes, it's good to worship. Yes, I love music. I love all that stuff. I love having a festival. It's, it's all great. But if we are not spending time in the Word of God, we're not going to be very effective. 
It's just the truth of it is. That's where we're at. And I love what John, in the Gospel of John it says this. John 16, 13. Write that down so you can read it later. But in John 16, 13, this Gospel, it says, When the Spirit of truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now what's happening here, even in our culture, is that the Word of God no longer has the weight that it used to, supposedly. Like it's outdated, it's offensive, all those different things. That, that was written for, for the context of those people in the first century, not here. Not here. Not 2019. But that's just not true. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He's the one that gives us truth. And truth doesn't change through the years. Because if truth changes, then it never was, to be, it never was truth to begin with. And I love this. He says, God just deposited himself in you through the Holy Spirit. And it is he, the Holy Spirit, who must teach us. And he that enables us to guard the truth and share it with others. And I, and I begin to think, if you look at the very beginning, like beginning, beginning, like Genesis chapter 3 beginning, the first thing that the enemy, that Satan, said to mankind, the very first thing that he said, and this, this he's, in the gar, he's in the garden, and they're about to just, the fall of man is about to happen, and God has given them one thing, don't eat from this tree, and Satan says, did God really say that? That's the first thing he says to mankind. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Do, do, you, do you honestly believe that applies to you? Are you sure? That's the first thing that he says. And I begin to think about that same lie is said to us today. That same whisper when we are about to pursue God like we never have before and it gets uncomfortable and we get overwhelmed and we don't know what to do but we have this passion to do something for the sake of the gospel and then all of a sudden the enemy says do you really think he meant that? do you really think that you can do that? do, do you really think based on your past based on the things that you've done based on what other people know about you, do you really think God meant that? That's what we tell ourselves. So that lie is still present today. From the first words that he says to mankind to 2019, it's the same lie. Basically, you aren't good enough and you never will be. God can't use you. God can't use a wretched sinner just like you. He's got way better people. He's got people that, man, they got seminary degrees. They got more degrees than a thermometer. They got it. He ain't going to use you. And we convince ourselves. So what do we do? Nothing. That's the greatest weapon the enemy uses when he convinces God's children to do nothing. It's the greatest weapon he uses. And that's why we preach that we are not about just a simple gathering. God went to the cross for so much more than just this. Is this good? Is this great? Absolutely. Is this biblical? Absolutely. But this isn't it. There's so much more that the Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit wants to use you for. Because there's something deep down in your heart that you've thought about for years. There, there's something deep down that you've wanted to do. There's a dream in your heart. There's something that's way beyond, doesn't even make sense, and you get overwhelmed just thinking about it. There's something in your life that you feel God is calling you to do, and the enemy is trying to convince you, ah, oh, that'll never happen. That's way too big. You think somebody's going to help you do that? They will laugh at you, bro. They will laugh at you. But God's saying, no, that's there for a reason. And it's the Holy Spirit speaking through you and to you. So he says, guard the good deposit that is in you. 
God has delivered you, he's redeemed you, and he has set you free. So go and be the child of God. Go and be the sons and daughters of God that he saved you to be. That he saved you to be. But here's what happens. And when, we, when we downgrade the word of God, we aren't holding this, this pattern of sound teaching. And that's what, that's what Paul was talking about. You see, for generations, the, the word of God has been attacked. It's not just something that maybe it's been happening here recently. Like it's been happening for generation, generation. And often it's been people, sadly, within the church that causes division, that causes strife, that causes people to butt heads. That say, And that's where we get kind of different denominations. That we can say, oh, they do things weird. They do this. They do that. They do the tongue thing. They do the prophesy thing. They, do, they don't drink wine over here. They don't do this. They don't do that. They can't dance over here. And so we automatically just pick and choose what we want to do. And we get confused. And we downplay the very power of the word of God. And that's what we've done as a culture and a church sometimes. So like when we, the things that we preach, the things that we teach, the things that we talk about. In order for us to talk about things that will help us grow, we talk about things that are very uncomfortable. That's the only way that we're going to grow. So I'll tell you up front, the reason that we take and we read and we study books of the Bible and we don't skip a verse. Because I, there's some stuff in here that I'm not looking forward to preaching. Because it, it's like, when I read it, it's like, really, we have to do that? Really? That's pretty rough. But see, we can't pick and choose. Oh, I really like this part. Oh, the grace of God. Yes, I'm put that in my pocket. Oh, this is the whole, yeah. I, I, I don't like that one. He can keep that one. Oh, same-sex marriage, he can keep that one. Self-righteousness, no, he, he can keep that one. No sex before marriage, oh, he can keep that one. Don't drink too much wine. He can keep that one. It's the weekend. So we pick and choose what we want. And the only way that we can be effective as a church is if we take the whole pie. We don't take just a sliver. We don't take just the one part that we like. Because that's how we grow. That's how we are being sanctified as believers and sanctified as the church. That's the only way that we can do it. And that's my prayer. Anytime that you hear me preach, or, and I'm not the only one that says this, but I, my biggest prayer is that, that this obviously is not about me. I, I want it to be about the word. And, and if you've heard it from me, you'll hear it a thousand times that we want the word of God to speak for itself. Yes, it's offensive. Yes, it steps on our toes. But it's the word of God. It's not my word. Like this is not the way I would plan it out. This is not the way I would plan out salvation. This is not the way I would plan out discipleship. If it were up to me, it'd be way easier. You know what I'm saying? Like, eat chicken wings and follow Jesus. Like, check. Watch football on the weekends. Check. But I'm not God, thankfully. Because I didn't die for you last I remembered. But the word of God is strong. And I love, if you look back in the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, he says, not one word has failed. I love that. Not one word has failed. And you talk about a season, this biblical season historically, like it was just going wrong. And the Lord delivered them out of exile. The Lord delivered them into the promised land. And Joshua says, not one word has failed. And that's my prayer for us. That's my prayer for you. Yes, you'll read things that will be confusing. You'll read things that, I don't know if I get that. But if all of his promises are yes and amen, you got to believe it because it's the word of God. That's why he's given this big book because it's, it's made to feed us through our entire life. I've been studying the, the Bible for years and years, and I still, like, I, I, there's still, I don't have a grasp on it, and I never will probably. It's so big. I don't know if you've noticed. There's a lot of pages. There's a lot of words. There's a lot there. I think it's, it's, it's there for us to continue to pursue, to continue to go after. Because the word of God is not, it's not meaningless. It is a matter of life and death. If you treat the scriptures as meaningless or as empty words, you will forfeit your life. And that may sound harsh, but that's just from the word of God. May we find delight in his word. May we have a thirst for his word. 
And my prayer and part of our core value here at the rising, a core value that we have here as a church is that we would always be biblically serious. We would always take the word of God, the Bible, seriously. All of it, every word. And we have to remain that way if we're going to fulfill God's calling on this church and on our lives. So if you go back to 15, so we ended in, I'm going to read 14 just to give us where we're at. God, or excuse me, guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Then he says in 15, you know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me. Now I read that, I'm like, really, everybody? Yeah, that's a lot of people. Everybody deserted you? I know this is pre-Facebook and you have fake friends, but somebody surely liked you, okay? But he says, everybody, everybody deserted me, including, here we go, Phygelus, you're welcome, and Hermogenes, or if you grew up in Lebanon like yeah, I did, Hermogenes, you're welcome, all right? And if you're having a kid and still kind of looking for a name, those two are very much available, all right? So he said, all these people have deserted me, including these guys. Which, wouldn't you hate to be these guys? Like, why you gotta, you said all of Asia. That included us. Why you gotta point us out, all right? But, and the thing is, we don't know much about these two that he mentions. But the, the truth is, if you kind of dig a little deeper, it's, it's likely that they were, they were leaders in the church who eventually opposed Paul. And they would not come to his defense when he went to jail, when he went to prison in Rome, where he's at now. But these so-called believers in Asia, were they were ashamed of Paul. And thus, they were ashamed of Christ as well. Then he says in verse 16, he says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. You're welcome. That one's still available too. He says, Because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. And he says in 18, May the Lord grant that he obtained mercy from him on that day. You know very well how much he ministered at Ephesus. And so what he's saying to Timothy is like, you know this guy, Onesiphorus, you know him. You've seen him. He, he's a part of your church. And, and he came and ministered to me. Like he, he breaks through the barriers. He, he pursued me diligently to just come and minister to me. So Paul, in, in the darkest state of his life, close to the end of his life, the wor living this kind of worst of the worst, and he's getting word, here's the deal, like he, Paul is getting fired up because he's getting word about Ephesus, about these churches that people are starting to buy into these false doctrines, buy into these false teachings. And so if you can imagine the Apostle Paul wrote over half the New Testament, he's locked up, chained up, he don't see sunlight. And he's hearing rumors, he's hearing these things that people are not preaching the gospel for what it is. And it's kind of like if, if you were locked up or somebody was talking and spreading rumors about you. And you know that they weren't true. And all you want to do is what? Tell the truth. But you can't. Just how much that would just burn your insides. And so you can imagine with Paul, he's given his life over to the gospel of Jesus. And people are buying into this false doctrine. And he's like, no, no. And there's nothing he can do. So the only thing that he can do is to write to his brother Timothy, his brother in Christ Timothy, and say, make sure that this doesn't happen. I, I'm hearing things. Make sure that this doesn't happen. Oh, and by the way, this Onesiphorus that he came and visited me, man, that was so cool. He didn't have to do that. I mean, nobody, I'm, I'm still waiting on you to come, you know. That's what he gets to a little later. But this guy comes in and visits him. It's like if, if we're going through Paul's mind, he gets fired up because it's not simply they're making rumors and things about him, but they're making things up about the gospel. But during Paul's ministry in Ephesus while he was there, Onesiphorus was a faithful minister at the church in Ephesus. So Timothy knew very much who this guy was. That's why he mentions him, all right? He didn't just kind of throw that random name in there. Say, hey, try to spell this one. Try to say this one. See, Onesiphorus, what he did is he traveled from Ephesus to Rome where Paul was. And he, like he said, they diligently looked for Paul so that he could simply minister to this prisoner. And this prisoner being Paul. And the thing that I love is, of course it means this, but Onesiphorus, it means profit bearing. That's what his name means. And so this man was not ashamed of Paul's chains, but simply wanted to get to him to minister to him. And how often, 
How often do we find ourselves making excuses to minister to people? Because you think about it, this Onesiphorus guy, he had to travel a good ways. He, he, he faced oppression. He faced persecution. He faced them threatening him with his life. And yet that still didn't stop him from doing what God had called him to. And God had put on Onesiphorus' heart, hey, you need to go minister. You need to go pray. You need to go encourage Paul. He needs it. How many times in our life that he's put somebody on your heart or you see somebody out at work or at the grocery store and you know, you know you're supposed to reach out and minister to that person and we come up with an excuse. May we not be that church. That we take every excuse away. Because here's the truth is that Onesiphorus, he, he could have come up with a list of excuses, but he didn't. And I love what Paul says. He says, he, Onesiphorus, he often refreshed me. He refreshed me. And the Greek word there is to, what it means right there is to cool again. So think about it this way. If, you, if you've ever been to Disney World in the summer, which is a terrible idea, you've been there and you know how hot it gets and you've waited in line for seven hours to ride a 30-second Dumbo ride, whatever it may be. Kids are just loving it, not really. And you're just hot and sweaty. And you somehow you find a restaurant or a restroom or, a, a, or even a ride. Space Mountain's a good one to cool off. You walk in there. And you ever walked into a room from being hot and sweaty and that cold air just hits you? And it's just the most amazing thing in the world. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, this is the greatest ride ever, you know? And I, <laughs> it reminds me of... There's a comedian called Jim Gaffigan, he, and I love his, he, he's pretty clean. Oh, we got some Jim Gaffigan fans, thanks. And uh, he has this bit where he says, taking his kids to Disney World, and he says, you know what my favorite ride was at Disney World? It was the air-conditioned bus back to the airport. But that's how we are. Like, we're, we're miserable, and the moment that we step in and that cool hits us, it is so refreshing. And that's what Paul's saying about Onesiphorus being there, that he refreshes him. So there's people in your life that need refreshing, and maybe you tonight need refreshing. That we need to wake up and realize who we are in Christ. And this all wraps around one thing. The reason Onesiphorus is doing this, the reason Paul is writing this and took note of this, is because it's all about discipleship. Again, we've said this before, discipleship is extremely personal. It's extremely personal. It can be awkward. It can be uncomfortable. But let's face it, it's what God has called us to. If we are not discipling one another, if we are not discipling new believers in Christ, if we're not discipling even unbelievers that are, that are just skeptics and they're trying to figure it out, we're not doing what God has called us to as the church. May we not be a church that just sits in a comfortable seat for an hour, hour and ten minutes, and then we go home. May we believe that the, the word that God calls us, the word, the word tells us that we should be courageous, the, the word tells us that we should be brave, the, the word reminds us who we are in Christ. That's why discipleship is the heartbeat of any church. It should be. It has to be. If it's not, you're just a country club. You're just a group of people that are just that like each other. Discipleship has to be the heartbeat of who you are. It is the fruit of who you are. It is the Holy Spirit working through you so that you can go and make more disciples. And so maybe the question is tonight, who in your life are you discipling right now? Who's somebody in your life that you could disciple right now? And maybe you can't think of anybody. And there's your homework. Find somebody that you can disciple. And you're like, I don't know how to study the word. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. I, I, this I, I'm pretty new to this. I don't get all of this. I don't understand it. And, and for years, I realized this a few years ago, I'd been studying the word of God all wrong, which is crazy to think about. I've been, been reading my Bible for years, but up until just a few years ago, I had understood and believed that I've been doing it all wrong. Because when I read the Bible, when I read the Word of God, the way I would read it before is I would read things that I have to do. God is, well, He wants me to make more disciples. God wants me to have more grace and be more patient and do this and do that. 
Instead of, the very first thing is when we read Scripture, it's not what we do, but we read the promises of God. We, we read the promise that God has for us, that, that you are holy, you are made righteous, that the fear doesn't exist in your life when the Holy Spirit dwells in you, that there's power, love, and self-control. Like, be reminded of those things first. Believe and read those things first. Journal those things first. Because you can't do the work of the ministry until the Holy Spirit and the Word of God does, does a work in you. You can't have one without the other. So that's why we're asking you to disciple people. And if you haven't found community, and, and, and here's the deal, like, I'm not asking you to be a part of a, a rising disciple group. That's not my heart. You can only be a part of, of a disciple group if it's just rising people. No. That's just stupid. You say, well, I, I go to a, another discipleship group or whatever they call it, life group, community group, people group, whatever it may be, and, they, and I, they, it's, it's of another church. You know what I'd say to that? Amen. <laughs> Keep going. I, I, it, we would never have this mentality where it's us versus them. The only thing that we care about here is that we're making disciples. I don't care what church you go to. As long as they're preaching the word of God and they're teaching the word of God for what it is, let's go. I'm pretty sure we're on the same team. But m maybe for some of you, you need to start a group. There's a group of people that, hey, let's go to Starbucks, Panera, let's do this, let's do that. Let's come to my house. Hey, on Halloween, we're not having a, a, a service. Let's all gather together and just hang out and eat chili because that's what you do when it gets cold outside. And we'll have walking tacos because it was really good at the fair a few months ago. And we'll do this and we'll do that. And we'll do it together and encourage and minister to one another. And hey, invite your friends. It doesn't matter. I don't care if they know Jesus or not. Like, bring them to us. Bring them to me. Like, that's the mentality of the church. That don't get your stuff all together. Don't get your life all perfect and glamorous and then come see me. Then you can come over. Then you can come to my church. Bring your wretched, ridiculous, crazy self and you can come to my house. You can eat at my table. Like that's, that's the church, y'all. All right? That's the church. And may as we, as we dive in to just continue to see what, what 2 Timothy, that what Timothy is learning just based on what Paul is trying to ingrain in his life, in his heart. That yes, dude, you're going to screw up. Yes, you're weak. Yes, you, you're going to mess up. But if Jesus is at the forefront, Jesus is ahead of everything else, bro, you're going to be fine. And so I say the same thing to you as, as a pastor. Don't feel like you've got to have it all figured out. My biggest prayer for the church in these first few months that we start building and reaching people, that we would pursue Jesus like we never have before. Pursue Jesus like we never have before. Like we're holding nothing back because he's worth all of our time. That we will make room. We will make room in our agenda. We'll push everything aside because discipleship is our heartbeat. Life change changes our heartbeat. It has to be or we're not the church. So that's the challenge tonight. That's what 2 Timothy in, in this passage is, is talking to us. And trying